and we can send the audio. We can send the audio to folks after. Hello, everybody, and welcome to what I decided was just going to be a lunchtime conversation, which, you know, I don't have my lunch in front of me, but if you do or are going to or taking this lunchtime for yourself or listening to this at some point in the future, thank you. Thank you for being here. Today was really inspired by a realization that I've had recently ongoing that, you know, um, people have a lot of assumptions about my energy and who I am and what it's like to be me all the time. And I realized that even though I think I'm pretty honest about who I am and I'm my true self, I can't help but be me, that there are real life ups and downs and that sometimes it's important to be explicit about those and share those. And this year has really been a year of learning for me, um, as all years are, as all life experiences are, but this year in particular taught me a few things. And as I know many of us are reflecting on kind of the end of the year, and I'm not a big January one, everything must change person. And yet we can't help but take stock to reflect, to begin to envision. And so my intention for today is that this conversation invites you to consider what it is like and what it might mean for you by way of some stories and some practices to really become and perhaps even be your own inner light switch and so that you can trust yourself and really live as your truest self, kind of no matter what's happening around you. So that's really, you know, kind of my intention and the ripple that I am hoping to create with this conversation. And I really would love it to be a conversation. Um, hello, my friends that are popping on. Um, it's so good to see you. I really would love it to be a conversation. So at any point, if you have questions, if there's something you wanna add, please feel free, you can pop it into the chat. You can use the fabulous Zoom function that raises hand um, if you'd like or not. You can even just take yourself off of mute and feel free to interject. <laughs> I won't say interrupt because I am of the belief that I can share some stories, I can share some ideas, I can share some practices, but at the core of much of the work that I do is the power of community to come together and create an even bigger ripple in our transformation. And I was speaking with a client earlier today and kind of talking about some of what's coming within my work next year. And she noted in the way that I described something and she was like, it really sounds like we're moving even more into transformation versus just observation. And I kind of paused and said, I don't mean that we only just observed, <laughs> right? That sometimes though you're given information and you can reflect on it and create your own transformation. But the way that I'm kind of moving, continuing to move into the work that I'm doing and creating impact with my clients is inviting kind of experiential opportunities so that transformation happens right away um, in little bits and bigger bits and everything in between. So today is a conversation about kind of how transformation has found me or how I've blocked it <laughs> for myself this year in an effort to be really transparent um, because I don't think it does anybody any good to believe that thriving is linear and that thriving looks like being up here. And for those of you that are just listening that um, can't see me, I'm pointing to like really high up, right? That thriving is a continuum and that we can find ways to thrive on any given day if we choose to, if we allow to. And so today is the story of the moments where 
that didn't happen. <laughs> the moments that I caught myself, the practices that allowed me to come back to myself. And you'll perhaps learn a few things that about me that might surprise you along the way. <laughs> what I would love to do to get us started is just to allow, um, if anybody has any, you know, burning, I always in groups, I always offer this at the start. Are there any burning, yearning, celebrations, noticings, questions that you just have to ask or comment on right now? That could even be something delightful that you experienced today. And if not, that's okay too. Okay. If you think of anything, let us know. <laughs> So let me share with you, well, actually, I'm going to share, I am I'm going to start with a card. So some of you that have hung out with me for any length of time know that I love to use oracle cards. I love to use any messages, right, to connect, to find sources of inspiration and wisdom within and then to, to ask questions. And so one of the, the resources that I love is a deck of cards by Kim Kranz. She's known as the Wild Unknown. And this is from her Animal Spirit Guidebook. And the deck of cards actually moves up in my closet, which is where I meditate in the morning. But I didn't bring the whole deck down. I brought the card. So this morning, I asked a question at the end of my practice of what was something that was really important for the listeners and participants of today's call to receive. And the card that came up was the swan. So for each card in the deck, there's, if you can see in her book, in the guidebook, there's a bit of an explanation. So I'm gonna read this to you as a way of just kind of opening our conversation. And maybe it'll resonate, maybe it won't, who knows what'll happen. So the swan is described as effortless, Effortless creativity, sensitive, mystic, elegant power. The swan represents heightened creativity. In Hindu mythology, the goddess Saraswati, the embodiment of language, creativity, and artistry, rides on the back of this graceful creature. The swan is ready to take us there, to the fluid realm of writing, creating, and reflecting. This potent and healing energy is not to be taken for granted or taken lightly. When the swan card appears, your soul is calling for attention, for solo time. An inner voice is waiting to be heard, an inner vision likely to be revealed. <laughs> I can't make this stuff up, friends. It happens most of the time that somehow when I, you know, do something like this for a group, it just, or for myself, right? The message is always just right. Especially if we just decide that whatever is there for us is really meant for us. If we learn to trust ourselves, what we're experiencing, what we're feeling, what we know. And so I um, love this card and kind of the invitation that it offers us to really listen, to allow our inner voice to be heard and our inner vision to be revealed. And I'll use that as kind of the context for beginning to share a bit of the real life of 2022 in Ellen land. <laughs> and I could make a very long list of circumstances of events that happened this year for you. And I will just for a hot second, list some of the moments that really stand out to me around this year. Not because the circumstances themselves are important, but because it's the circumstances that led me to some experiences, to some thoughts, to some patterns and ways of being, and eventually to either feeling stuck <laughs> or creating becoming my own light switch, reminding myself that I was my own light switch and creating the transformation that was right in front of me. So this year I had, I often pick a word of the year. Does anybody 
ever pick a word of the year. If you had one this year and you're able to, you're welcome to put it into the chat. My word of the year was whoosh. Now, some of you might know, I have, I have a prop, not really, it just sits on my desk. I wrote a book this year. It's funny because I haven't really mentioned the book that I've written this year in a long time. Kathy's word was abundance of time and energy. Yeah, thank you. So my word was whoosh. And it in part was because my book was going to publish on January 31st. And I really wanted this year to be about creating a whoosh, a whoosh kind of like a ripple of joy, of delight, of thriving, of me showing up in the world and allowing things to be felt, right? That feeling of real kind of, can you imagine just for a moment, if you think about the word whoosh, right? There's a, there's a feeling. And I really envisioned everything that I did. I wanted it to have kind of a whoosh effect to ripple out. I love that word. <laughs> and in many ways, 2022 was absolutely a whoosh, not at all in the ways I intended. So one of the very first things that happened in the year, actually, the first thing that happened was leading an amazing retreat in Mexico. So last year's Nurture and Nourish You retreat. I came back from that retreat just on, I mean, all the whooshing, all the ripples. And then my book was set to publish. And on the day my book officially launched, I broke my wrist. I was walking the dog. And if you are from Northern Virginia, you understand, or if you're not, you welcome to winter in Northern Virginia, you never really know. And, you know, it can be 55 degrees on one day and 18 degrees on another, maybe not that extreme. But I remember thinking that morning, hmm. I don't know what shoe should I put on to go walk Jupiter because I have this fear of falling on the ice, never fallen on the ice, but I have a fear of falling on the ice. And my brain was literally actually a deeper part of me, not my brain was saying to me, like, be intentional about what you're putting on your feet. I didn't listen. I was in a rush. I had book thingamajiggies to do. So I went out on the street with the dog in my Uggs. And if you know, the soles of Uggs, there's very little traction. And in fact, a patch of black ice found me. I have never broken anything in my, well, a limb in my body. I've had some other things in my body. And so I didn't really know what had happened. I just knew it hurt. So I came back home and I'm kind of giving you all the details because it was this fascinating moment for me. I came back home and I kind of still didn't know what I'd to do. And my, it was the first day back in the office for my husband after all things pandemic. <laughs> so he wasn't home. So I called my dad because that's still what I do at 48. <laughs> and he was like, you need to go to the emergency room. <laughs> it is likely that you broke your wrist when I described the fall. I'm like, no, he's like, go to the emergency room. So I had to call my husband who came home, brought me moral of the story. I had in fact broken my wrist. I'm sharing that detail with you because the breaking of my wrist toppled me over <laughs> in a way that a part of me, the not very kind part of me, the inner critic part of me would say like, you're ridiculous. It's a broken wrist. Could have been so much worse, but it was the broken wrist on my right side. And what happened more than the circumstance of not being able to write, not being able to do a lot of the things that I really love to do was it triggered an old story of mine that my body isn't strong, that I can't trust my body. That is a very old and longly, longly, not a word, um, well woven groove in kind of my brain back from when I was in my early twenties and was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma when seemingly I was living my very best life. So there were two actual stories that got triggered, my body, isn't something that I can rely on. It's not strong and good things don't last. And what happened to me in that time is I fell down the rabbit hole of all things doubt, of all things feeling like things were impossible. 
and kind of wanting to, my old self would have been like, all right, bulldoze through, make a path. And I was not able to do that. I was really, really thrown off. And I would say to you that all of the practices that I usually tap into to reconnect with me felt unavailable to me. It's not actually true, but at the moment they felt unavailable to me. My journaling, even my workouts, the orthopedic surgeon, which I didn't need surgery, by the way, I kept saying, well, you can work out. And I'm like, you want me to sweat in a cast? It was gross, right? I couldn't make any room for that possibility. My yoga practices, everything felt unavailable to me. I was in that space of can't, broken, needing to be fixed, nothing was possible. Raise your hand if you have ever felt that way. <laughs> or even if I can't see you, do a little blink of the eyes, right? My hunch is that each of you is has experienced that. Yeah, thank you, right? And so what did it take? What did it take? Well, it took me getting nudged from people that love me. And it took me reconnecting to two things, patience with myself and trust. And I say that because when I think about 2022, the lessons that I kept learning literally kept finding me over and over and over again. Because I told you I was going to share real life things. And this isn't, I don't want this just to be a list about all the bad things that happened to Ellen in 2022. Also, because relatively speaking, my bad things in this in the scheme of like the big, big world where horrible things are happening aren't that big of a deal. And yet, right, in our lives, we tend, our brain has a negativity bias. We can list, we can come up with all the evidence of what wasn't working. And so I share some of these experiences with you as an opportunity to just kind of see in, right? And hopefully by the end, you'll kind of see the pattern. <laughs> so there was the wrist. A few months later, my dog was attacked on our front porch by our neighbor's dog. And this was the second attack. This time it was on our front porch. The first time it wasn't. This time the dog actually got bitten and needed stitches. He's okay. He's fabulous. But it happening on my front porch and creating the moment that it created where I was, my husband was actually taking the dog out for the walk. I was going up the stairs inside to go shower. And I heard this sound. And it was the like a blood curdling shriek. I can't even describe it except that I can hear it. And so in that moment, the relationship with my neighbors fell into the abyss. <laughs> and I started questioning another story of mine, an old thought about not belonging, it not feeling safe, my home not being a place where we belonged. I wanted as quickly as possible for us to move. <laughs> <laughs> because one of the things you may not know about me is that I'm like, this happened and then shoo, we should do this. It's not always the best idea. But I went into like fixing reactive survival mode, right? And suddenly, anytime I thought about my porch, I heard that sound. I couldn't, I didn't want to be on my porch because it brought up all of these ideas of not belonging and not feeling safe. Fast forward, if I think about kind of where I went in all of that time with all of this doubt still of my body, of myself, now of belonging, believing that good things can't last, friends, I started to question my marriage. Do you notice the whoosh that I was creating? <laughs> right, like it was one ripple after another. And I started to notice all the things that weren't going well in my marriage and in my relationship. Nothing had changed, but suddenly it was all I could think about, which threw me in thankfully to therapy and all sorts of other things and really kind of exploring what it means to connect. But in all of that, I uncovered some realizations about myself. 
that I like to be self-sufficient and believe that I shouldn't have to rely on anybody else. So then think back to having broken my wrist. Suddenly, I couldn't rely on myself, right? All of these stories started to accumulate and become like this very big snowball at the top of a mountain that was lurking and wanting to kind of roll down and over me. The last kind of big moment of my year or thing that really impacted it, there were a few, actually there were two more, was I've been co-parenting my daughter with my daughter's dad for, she just turned 18, so 15 years as divorced parents. And we have made it our mission, or we had made it our mission to be as amicable and supportive, uh, one united front as possible over all these years. Well, this year we blew it. And I say we, because I mean, I can say all that I want about my ex-husband, but it was we. And that created, right? Kind of, again, re-triggered thoughts, old stories, patterns about not belonging, trusting, needing to do things myself, right? And the last kind of piece of all of this was some of you might know, some of you don't. I was born in Venice, Italy, two Italian parents. Actually, it gets super complicated, not worth it. But I've been a dual citizen, kind of for most of my life on paper since 1992. <laughs> I was naturalized as a US citizen when I was young as a minor through my mom. Well, over the summer we were in Italy and all of these things happened and I needed to update my identity card. And when I went to City Hall to update my identity card, they said I didn't exist. <laughs> now, for someone who's already questioning their belonging, who they are and what makes them them, I, like the rabbit hole just got deeper, right? Suddenly it was as if everything I thought I knew about myself wasn't true, or so my brain wanted me to believe. I share all of these circumstances with you, again, not because of the details and not because they are massive life experiences, but because a few things happened. Some old stories of mine that I've worked really hard to allow and also choose other <laughs> versions of truths over the years became magnified. And in that process, doubt, overthinking, and a disconnection from myself took me away from the practices that had always helped me connect to my thriving, right? It took me, they took these circumstances and these thoughts took me out of my truths, what I knew to be true, right? What my heart knew to be true. And it took me out of my delight. And that might sound like a ridiculous thing to say, but here's the thing about delight. I think it's essential for all of us. And for me, it is one of my core values. It is one of the things that makes me me. And what was happening was that I would go through these experiences and I would kind of reconnect. I would, I would self-care my way through it. And I love to say that I don't like the word self-care. And this year is an example of why. Because we can put a lot of things on our to-do lists, our tending practices. But if we're doing them because we expect an outcome, or we're doing them without absorbing, really connecting to the deeper why, they become like Band-Aids. And friends, Band-Aids fall off, right? It's the healing that we want to really nourish. It's the inner landscape that we want to really tend to. And over the course of the year, I probably band-aided my way through a lot of my thriving. And sometimes, friends, that's the very best we can do. So none of my confessions <laughs> or reflections are judgments, right? It's awareness. And I can look back. I'm also, um, those of you that 
or just getting to know me will realize that I can make meaning out of anything. And I have been told by several of my mentors and coaches, Elena, sometimes like the thing is just a thing. Can you allow it not to have a ripple? And there is a place for that. And there's also a place, at least for me, and just looking at from a big picture perspective of, okay, look at what happened. There were these circumstances. They took me out of who I was and how I tend to myself. They threw me down some rabbit holes. And then it's like this cyclical effect, right? It's this snowball and a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. So a few things helped me throughout the year reconnect to my thriving as I went and create a foundation so that every time the next thing happened, I still had my moments. I still reacted. Friends, I'm Italian and Jewish. There are big reactions that happen. Also a Leo. I am all fire, (laughs) except for when I'm not, right? And so getting me to a place of tending to the inner growth. If I really think about this year, it's not that I didn't thrive because I did. My thriving, what I've come to realize was an inner growth thriving versus something that you could see on the outside. Has anybody seen, there's a poster I remember um, it being in my classroom as a classroom when I was a classroom teacher, but it's of a glacier, right? And the glacier, usually when you are thinking about a glacier, you think about the top of the glacier that you can see above the water. But the reality is that there is lots of glacier mass underneath the water as well, right? It's keeping that part that you can see upright. We can think about this with trees. In fact, just today I was walking the dog and there are a lot of trees that I guess were damaged or not growing that have been replaced in the last few days. And because it's raining, maybe I haven't been walking the dog as much. Don't tell anybody. (laughs) He's fine. But the new trees are planted, the old trees or kind of the stump, and then all of the root structure were there waiting to be picked up. And I kind of sat there just looking at these root structures. There were... I mean, the roots were significant. These weren't trees that didn't have roots. And yet, right, they hadn't grown. They hadn't found the nourishment. For whatever reason, they weren't growing. And so there is this reminder. I think we have this expectation when we think about thriving that it has to be big and outward and always up here, again, pointing over my head, (laughs) to it being fabulous. And what I would love to offer is that sometimes thriving is about how we tend to ourselves on the inside, about the allowing and space that we create and possibility that we create on the inside, and that it's not always rainbows and unicorns, and that's okay. That expecting it to always be rainbows and unicorns, always to be growth, right? Growth on top of growth on top of growth is setting ourselves up for incredibly unrealistic expectations and then to be disappointed. Does that land or resonate with anybody? Yeah. So... What I'll offer now are some practices, the things that I turned to throughout the year and that I've really reconnected to as kind of some of the core foundations for creating an ability to thrive, a capacity to thrive, no matter what's happening. And these practices don't erase the hard stuff. They don't necessarily change the hard stuff, but what they do is they create a landscape on the inside that empowers us to show up as our truest self versus that reactive survival mode self, yeah? Because when we get pulled away 
And I'll use myself as an example. When I got pulled away this year, a few things happened. I started hiding, meaning turning from my truest self, not taking care of myself in the ways that I know my truest self really needs. I also kind of started isolating from others and from wanting to do things, right? Think about the example on my street. When the dog was attacked, right? I wanted to move instead of connect to the relationships that I did have and that were positive on the street. So kind of putting the walls up and isolating. The other thing that can happen is a sense of numbing, right? So Netflix, <laughs> you can be real. I'm super excited to watch Emily in Paris coming out in a few weeks and Jack Ryan that's coming out in a few weeks. And what did I just realize is coming out in a few weeks? Something else. Oh, no, friends, I discovered last night, total tangent. There is a show on Netflix called I Hate Christmas. But that's not the important thing. Um, it's Italian and filmed in Venice. And my husband and I were watching the last episode of The Crown. And then if you know Netflix, right, it shows you previews of things. And I couldn't figure out what we were watching other than I was like, that's in Venice, yeah. And I kind of kept watching. It was like, what is it? And it's in Italian. And then come to discover that the little box underneath it said, I hate Christmas, all Gio Natale in Italian. And it, so I'm super excited to watch this. That type of Netflix watching, you could hear the delight in my voice, right? I am so excited. But the like sitting in front of the TV, kind of avoiding other things, that's more of a numbing practice, right? And sometimes that is the very best we can do. And there's absolutely a place for that. But when, when that becomes the go-to, then we're not turning towards what our truest self really needs and probably not being nourished and leaning into our core values. Yeah. The other thing that can happen is burnout. The things that we love to do no longer feel as fulfilling, right? We're simply so depleted and tired that no matter what we're doing, doing, <laughs> we can't feel filled up. And so what I want to share is when you recognize that you are moving in those directions or that life is happening, or just in terms of building your own thriving toolkit, because the practices that I'm going to share aren't just for the hard days. In fact, I would offer that they're really important to build a foundation of on the fabulous days as well. Because if we only tap into them on the hard days, the muscle memory isn't the same, right? It's not going to have that same kind of coming home effect. When I think about a lot of the practices and this idea of showing up as your truest self and being your own light switch, this is really about coming home to yourself, seeing yourself as home. So here are some of the practices and just kind of conversations. The first is reconnecting with your body in a relationship that's built on trust, meaning deciding that your body is full of information. And side note, it is. It knows things long before your brain does, but we have to trust it. And for those of us that have been disconnected from our body or who tend to see our body in not the kindest way, right? There's an opportunity to really get grounded and rooted and that can be as simple as a body scan laying on your bed, on a yoga mat, on a blanket, and just becoming aware of, of sensations in your body. It can also be one of my favorite ways to connect with my body is when something is speaking to me, I talk to it. And this is actually, I love doing this with clients. Um, last week, um, I was working a few weeks ago, I was working with a client who had a rash. And so we created a bit of an experience where she became the rash and we had a conversation with the rash and what the rash wanted that particular individual to know why it was there, what it wanted her to know, right? So if we start seeing the messages of our body as benevolent messengers, messages, then we can learn from, we can be in connection with versus fighting it. 
So when I broke my wrist, when I was able to create some distance around the frustration, I started asking my wrist, what did it need? Earlier this week, my eye was doing this thing. It was super red. And so I spoke with my eye, to my eye, and I allowed it to speak back to me. And that can sound odd to a lot of people, but it's a beautiful practice to really connect with yourself and decide that everything you need and want is inside you, right? To really tap into that source of wisdom that's inside you. So there's a trust, there's a connection, it's a nurturing. And friends, it's a relationship that you're building, right? Especially if you've been out of relationship with your body, it's a relationship that you're building. So it's not gonna happen all at once. So the body is an amazing access point. The heart. The heart, and, and when I think about heart, I'm thinking kind of soul, but, but this heart, this thing that beats, and I am pointing here, it's really like <laughs> anatomically, it doesn't matter, <laughs> right? But it's this thing that beats, that creates inner ripples, inner echoes. And I love to check in. In fact, one of my daily questions, especially, and, and it's one of the things I stopped doing, Right. So here's what I want to share with you. All of these practices, when I got really spinny or steeped in doubt, I started avoiding my practices. And that's always one telltale sign for me of how many days has it been since I've checked in with my body or that I've asked my heart this question and I'm about to share. Right. Because if I've disconnected from those practices, it's likely that I've disconnected from the wisdom that's inside me. Yeah. So taking a few breaths and asking your heart, what does it want you to know today? Uh, so Tracy Stanley, one of my mentors and teachers um, is this amazing guide and she loves to ask the question, what is the message of my heart today? It's the way she phrases it. And it's a beautiful way to just, A, assume that your, your heart does have a message, allow it to have a message, okay? So kind of the body and the heart, the turning inward for the wisdom, for the knowledge, for the clarity. Then let's talk about the brain for a second, shall we? <laughs> because the brain is really busy in all of these circumstances, tallying all sorts of things. And friends, this is not about not the brain not having thoughts because it does have thoughts. It's got something like 70 to 90,000 thoughts on a given day. So it's not about not having thoughts but it's about becoming aware of them. So kind of that self-awareness of what is the brain thinking about right now? And creating space for the and, meaning. We can come up with a laundry list of all the things that aren't working. Can you also allow for the fact that life is not all or nothing? That it can be true that it's cloudy right now, and that it was sunny earlier, right? Both are true outside my window. <laughs> One does not undo the other. And yet we tend to live in the undoing, the all or nothing. And so allowing for the and, noticing the things that are frustrating, that tick you off, right? Again, life is a full spectrum of experiences to be sad, to be whatever, and create space for what's working or for awareness or progress for the little moments, perhaps for delight, which we'll get to in a second, okay? So for instance, if I think about my wrist, right? No, I couldn't write with my right hand. In fact, I was just looking at some journals, um, some journal writing that I had done earlier this year. And it was just so funny because you can, I can see when I, there were, when I started, when I had the cast on, I was like, oh, I can try, I can write. <laughs> my handwriting is already messy. Actually, I think it was neater when my, when it was broken because I was writing so slowly, but it looked like the writing of a four or five-year-old. <laughs> um, so it threw me back a little bit. I had a good giggle at my expense, but right. I can choose to focus on the fact that it was broken, or I could choose to notice, create space for the and, and realize, and I didn't need surgery. Actually, my healing process was pretty good. It was pretty quick, right?
right? So rather than only focusing on the negative, it's not about ignoring it, but it's creating space for the and. And the and is a space opener. And it is one of the most powerful tools that you can have in your thriving toolkit, right? To allow space for the and, okay? The last thing, and it's perhaps the most magical, maybe, I mean, they're all pretty magical, is to allow and be nourished by delight. And delight is this fascinating thing. I was speaking to a client earlier this morning who's um, been in many Thrive Circles and Thrive Unleashed, all the things that came before what is the new Thrive Circle. And she resisted whenever I talked about delight or pleasure. She kept coming up with other synonyms. She really didn't want to use these words. And when we started, and I always ask the question, what's working right now? She was like, oh my gosh. So I've finally given in. Like, delight is a thing. <laughs> And she had a good laugh with herself at, you know, this resistance that we have to allowing ourselves to create delight, to receive delight. And yet the realization that it is, it is a powerful filler upper and delight. What I want to say about delight is I'm not talking about fireworks, rainbow and unicorn delight. That's delightful. And yet that's not every day right? I love and believe in unexpected delight, everyday delight, looking out the window and instead of saying, yeah, no, there aren't any fun colors or mm, saying, wow, like look at the birds at the treehouse right now or the sound of the woodpecker, okay? Allowing the most mundane of things to be wondrous. It's tapping back into that inner child that we all were once that is kind of amazed and in awe. And I'm not saying we should all walk around amazed and in awe all the time, but allowing ourselves to be touched, to our, for our hearts to be stirred by moments that create an inner ripple. Right? Because if I think about delight, to me, there's an inner ripple that it creates. It's, it's a lighting up and we could talk about the hormones that it releases, but it's really this, it's this inner filling up. And what's interesting is if I think about what happened this year for me is that I experienced a lot of delight, but when I got stuck in the spin and the doubt and the overthinking, I muted my delight. I kind of tamped it down. And one of the best ways for me to reconnect to the, the truest version of me is to connect through delight, right? So a few days ago, yesterday, I made a list. I was like, what might feel like delight today? And I decided that going to sit, it was raining, but I knew it was going to be about 50 degrees and we have an outdoor kind of living area, an outdoor porch, it's covered. So I can sit out there and not get rained on. And we have a fire pit. It's propane. I was like, I'm going to go sit outside and do an hour of work outside. And that's just going to feel delightful. Well, it turns out that I went out there that there is no propane in the propane tank. And so I could have looked at that opportunity and thought, well, this sucks. <laughs> but what I decided to do is actually, I allowed myself to name something that would be delightful. I followed through. I, cr I prioritized it. No, it didn't go the way I planned. And isn't that the point? <laughs> and so I got to sit there not being delighted by a propane infused tire, uh, fire, not tire, but by the landscape of the trees and the birds that were flying by, by the everyday things. And so just allowing that, yeah? So those are three kind of practices, kind of ways to, that I really, always tap into, well, <laughs> when I'm allowing myself, right? And they're important because they're the things that I was avoiding this year when I started to get a little spinny. And yet they're also the things that brought me back. And so 
my invitation to you, my nudge to you is to consider, right? So often when we land in these places, when real life starts to happen, we start to disconnect ourselves from the nourishment that we need. And also the reminder that this nourishment that we need, it's about filling up as we go, instead of just when we're in crisis mode, because then we're already depleted. It's really hard to fill back up fast. That's the Band-Aid effect, right? When we do that, we might feel better for a hot second versus filling up over time and letting it be about tending and nourishment. So I've talked a lot, way more than I think I normally do. <laughs> um, so I want to just pause and create space for any questions, noticings, reflections, what stands out to you in terms of your own experience that feels important that you want to kind of percolate on comes up for you. And also for those of you that don't know, I was a former classroom teacher, so I have incredible wait time. <laughs> I won't do that to you today, but those that are in any of my groups know that I can wait you out <laughs> in the best, most nurturing way possible. <laughs> right? Suzanne says me too. I mean, it's a gift. Any questions, noticings, reflections, thoughts, skepticism? I love skepticism too. I'm going on camera. Hi, Maddie. Hello. Um, <clears throat> what resonated for me was how much of your story is so relatable mm -hmm. and uh, how important it is. I think when you were sharing, I was thinking, you know, one of the benefits of doing this, of kind of putting it out there in the universe, in your universe with us, is to not let it have the power it's had over you, mm -hmm. to like put it out there and say, I'm releasing it. And I am con conscientious of how it was holding me back or mm -hmm. how I was, how it was impacting me. And I'm ready to move on to the ne next step, which was very, really spoke to the, some of the things that I've gone through this, this year, both physically and emotionally. Um, I just recently had both my eyes, uh, my cataracts removed and um, it's, I go outside and like, I don't have to be afraid of how I'm walking in quite the same way. And so um, kind of getting, feeling a little bit more of a, um, a new lease on, on life and wanting to re-engage in some of the physical things I haven't done that I've sort of used Netflix or TV to avoid as well. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Kathy, for sharing that. And I'm so excited for your new, <laughs> even your <clear> sight. <laughs> yes. And thank you for, there is an element of, right, when we share, and that's also why, you know, that speaks to why I believe so much in retreats and experiences that are group community-based because there is something about when we acknowledge and honor because there's also an honoring, right? I don't I mean the things that happened, they happened. I, it doesn't help me to second guess, to regret, to any of those things, do I? And so just kind of really deciding, like, what is it that mattered here? And one of the things that, you know, I have recognized about myself is I'm, I mentioned I can make meaning out of anything, right? In the life where I was more in survival mode. So before this year, when, when I was going through my cancer treatments of those things, I was that person who looked for silver linings and would silver lining myself out of anything, right? I'd see the thing and I'd be like, oh, but, and I'd, I'd switch to the and, right? Really quickly. And, and I talked about the and as a powerful strategy, but it's a powerful practice because the first step is the acknowledgement and the honoring and noticing what it's creating, right? If we don't locate ourselves on the map of who we are in a given moment, it's really hard to get to where we want to go. So there is an important aspect to naming even the gunk, right? And to your point, when we name it, it is easier to release it. 
right? Or to catch ourselves. Thank you, Kathy. Yeah. Yeah, Suzanne. Hello. Hi. It's nice to see you. I'm not on camera because I was just working out and you don't want to see me. <laughs> it is but, great um, to have you here. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm not going to tell you everything that, that's going through my mind because it would take a long time. But um, I saw the email this morning inviting, you know, me to this call. I thought, oh, gosh, I, you know, I've, I'd love to just be in her presence and see her and hear her since I haven't seen you in so long. And then I went down to work out and I listened to a podcast. I don't know if you know Mel Robbins. Mm -hmm. She had um, a guy on talking about synchronicity and the physics behind how we are all connected and how we should be looking for those moments and those signs you know that were on the right track mm -hmm. so I came up turned on your podcast or your sorry your meeting here and one of the first signs that I was on the right track you know came quite cr quickly when you read the description of the swan this mm -hmm. need for solitude and I was like well bingo <laughs> I've been thinking about that lately but as you went through all the things that happened to you this year, I made connections with so many of them. And I was just like, this, you know, this is really cool. You know, mm -hmm. I was meant to be here today and hear what you had to say. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for creating space for it. Yes to synchronicities. And I'm so glad the swan card resonated and all of it. I'm so glad that you were here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, me too. Yeah. yeah. And that's the piece, right? Of even this, you bring up a great, um, it's another prompt, right? Like even this, how do I know I'm on the right track? We can get really spinny <laughs> in doubt about wondering and where are we on the path and shouldn't we be farther on the path and all the things about the path. <laughs> and so there's a trust element of ourselves trusting the path, but it's a fun question. If, if you've never played with it for anybody that's listening to decide like, okay. Um, and, and almost as an experiment, so really not attached to the outcomes, right. But to decide, okay. Um, and I've, I've done this on walks with the dog, it drives on the car on trips, you know, um, I'm looking for the universe to send me a sign that I'm on the right path. And sometimes I direct it. I'm like, if I see a butterfly, I'll know, right? Or whatever it is. So you can play with making it really big and open or more specific, but it can be just interesting to notice that there are signs and messages everywhere, but we have to be moving slowly enough to receive them. We have to allow them, right? So thank you, Suzanne. Um, for, for that nudge as well. I appreciate you being here and sharing that and sharing your energy. <laughs> well, I'm glad to be here. Glad to see you. Anyone else? Thoughts, questions, noticings, reflections? Okay. So what I want to leave you with is you know, because if we think about this idea of observing and insight and motivation and inspiration, those are all fabulous. The transformation happens when you make meaning in your own way, right? When you allow an experience to be something that creates an inner ripple. And, you know, as much as I'm a big believer in being versus doing, there's the invitation to allow the being to then inform the doing. So I would invite you to consider, right? What is one thing you wanna take away from this conversation, from anything that struck you? Whether it's the note from the swan card or one of the practices or anything in between. And just kind of jot a note to yourself if, you're, um, if you can write right now or just make a mental note of, right? What's one thing that you really, really wanna bring forward for yourself? And that could be an exploration, it could be anything. 
If you want to share that with us, I would love for you to put that in the chat, or you can follow up with me later over email. You can always just hit reply to one of the bazillion emails that you get from me <laughs> and, um, and share that takeaway. And this, so that you know, we'll also be going out, there will be a replay um, later today. So you'll also have the audio that you can go back and listen to if you really want to be delighted by all the stories again at any time or go back to anything. The other thing that I want to just invite you to consider is as you think about bringing whatever it is you want to bring forward, right? Is there a support or a resource that would be helpful to you? You know, I do this and I'm pretty good at it. <laughs> and I have lots of supports and resources. And also, if there's something that you're looking for that I'm not a great fit for, or that I think there's something else, I would love to, to send you in that direction, right? So when I invite people to kind of ask for what they need and reach out and consider, you know, is something that I have or can offer, um, a possibility for you? Would it feel delicious and supportive and delightful to you? There's, it's always a conversation about what is it that you really are needing and craving? And if it's not me, um, then there's probably something that I can suggest uh, or a resource or a book or a podcast or something. If some of the practices that we talked about and this idea of creating your own inner transformation, being your own light switch, within the space of community and connection is something that does feel supportive for you, um, please reach out and chat with me. The new Thrive Circle, which I'm so excited about, um, starts in January. And there are some differences in it from past years, but the, the main difference is that it's one community and versus all the different things that I had in the past, which is just going to help people feel more supported and connected to one another. And the other, the, the big massive difference in terms of the benefit to you is that each month, everything is going to be offered through the lens of a practice. So we're going to have an experience, right? You're going to get to practice something and that will create an inner shift maybe of awareness, who knows of what right away. And then it'll be something that creates its own ripple effect for you and allows you to not just expand your capacity to thrive, but be live as your truest, most uninhibited, joyful self. And, you know, we're going to be talking about things like pleasure and delight and desire and your core values and your truest self and allowing all of those things, but all from the starting place of your body and kind of connecting to your truest self on that embodied somatic soul level. So if that's at all of interest to you, reach out, ask your questions, Let's chat. I love having conversations. I love asking you questions to help you figure out if it's a hell yes or a hell no. And I never take it personally. <laughs> so I am all about just helping you find your own inner clarity through the work that I do and through these conversations. Thank you for being here, everyone. I am so grateful that you took this time. Thank you, Kathy. Um, please reach out. I'm happy to linger if you have questions or comments or thoughts. Um, but I am so, so grateful that you took the time to be here, to listen, to engage uh, in, in whatever way things are percolating. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I hope everyone has a great rest of the day and week. Mwah. You're welcome. You're welcome, Michelle. Thank you, Beatrice. Thanks, Suzanne. All right, I'm going to stop the recording.